Humans have this need to uh, have some mental order of things, so to organize things in their minds. Because if it's all just a muddled mess, it's hard to remember anything. So you need to have some labels on these uh, mental bins, so to speak. For example, you know that, oh, willow bark is good for uh, willow bark tea, which is good for headaches. So basically, this later uh, became aspirin or acetosalicylic acid. Now, other things that we might need classification for would be, say, oh, you know your friend has three dogs and you your friend invites you to go hunting with him. Now, should you be bringing something that's suitable for taking down big prey or little prey? Well, you know that he has two poodles, so two little pet dogs, and a hunting mastiff, so a big dog. Now, he kn you know that one of his three dogs is too injured to hunt. Obviously, you're going to want to know which one is too injured to go out today, yeah? So that's going to decide what you're hunting. So people have this need to give things labels to make our lives more convenient and more organized and generally uh, easier. So biological classification is the systematic grouping of organisms into biological categories based on physical and evolutionary relationships. This is a matter of, hmm, I don't want to get confused, do I? Well, better organize something then. Especially when I'm corresponding with some guy who's a long, long distance away, so references to local organisms may not quite get the point through unless I attach some sort of name to it. So taxonomy is a science of classifying all organisms. Taxonomists work with both living and dead, as in fossilized, species. Now obviously living species tend to be easier to work with given morphology is more obvious, especially for soft tissues of living species. But morphology can often be misleading. For example, these two butterflies are the same species despite their differences in wing coloration. They have diverged somewhat genetically because wing coloration is heritable in butterflies but they are still reproductively compatible, so at least for now they are still the same species. Now juveniles and adults can look quite different within a species, which is of course a problem uh, given that in the past there have been quite a number of cases where juveniles and adults or even males and females have been identified as different species initially based on just morphology or phenotype, as in, say, coloration and morphology. Early biological classification systems really got started with botanists, or botanists. So these guys studied plants. Why is this important? Because of, well, herb lore. So even before humans learned how to cultivate uh, crops, so agriculture, even before that, humans were already aware that when you had certain symptoms, certain plants could help relieve those symptoms. That's why there's a concept of a tribe shaman or a wise woman or whatever. So these elders kept track of herb lore by their experiences and by their memories. Now, if you want to make this a little bit more widespread, what do you need to do? You need to codify it somehow so that when people talk to one another about some plant, they could communicate faster, which of course in medicine can be quite relevant. And. Uh, Slow communication is potentially dangerous for the patients. Now, please note that early botanists were not necessarily scientists who specialized in anything. They were not necessarily 
plant biologists as we may think of them now. Because the scientific uh, process was something that was really uh, invented a little later. However, these people d were aware enough of how to use the plants in their environment that they needed to be able to communicate it to others easily. Which meant that they were trying to figure out how to classify plants based on say their leaf shape and so on and other characteristics. Now, initially people worked on a hierarchy of species. So they believed that even the simplest animal, moving things, were more complex than the most complex plants. For example, they believed that Hydra, as in a small freshwater Nidarian, which lives in a polyp form with many tentacles. Of course, this uh, actually took a while to be discovered, as in after the magnifying glass. So Hydra, or flatworms for that matter, were more complex to these people than say orchids. Orchids have very complex flowers. Now this hierarchy of life thing of course happened to put humans at the top. Now this is probably a requirement for every sapient species that actually surely arose or will arise anywhere to uh, put themselves first. Because self-interest is one of the fundamentals of evolution. It's also uh, why people get cancer because the selfish gene concept and so on. But that's another matter. So originally they started with well a number of levels. These were later codified into say genus. The original levels were probably something like oh plants that have flowers, plants that don't have flowers. Well okay this is kind of evident yes. By the way fungi were not recognized as a distinct group from plants until rather later. Now Linnaeus came up with binomial nomenclature which is a system where each species has a genus name followed by a specific name. The two words taken together form the species name. For example, by the way, these are all supposed to be italicized. The species name is lowercase to start. The genus name is uppercase to start. This is very important. And if you have any uh, subspecies names, you write them also lowercase to start after this. So say Homo sapiens sapiens. Unfortunately, uh, we don't seem all that wise for the most part. Now, a genus is a matter of a group of similar species. Currently, only Homo sapiens remains of the genus Homo or man. Now a taxon is just a category in general. Now taxa can come in many levels. For example, kingdom, the highest taxonomic level in the original Linnaean system where he only identified animals and plants. Above this we have domain, namely eukarya, bacteria, and archaea. Kingdom, Phylum, class, phylum includes stuff like chordata, i.e. chordates, those organisms that have a notochord at some point in their life, uh, have a post-anal tail at some point in their life, have pharyngeal slits at some point in their life, etc. So, class includes stuff like mammalia or reptilia. Uh, traditionally, aves or aves or whatever you call it, A-V-E-S, was the Linnaean class for birds, but since it has been recognized that birds are closer related to reptiles and are uh, have a common ancestor with reptiles, 
later than their common ancestor with say mammals or amphibians? Well, terminology may vary. Now there's also other uh, labels between these main categories such as uh, vertebrates but uh, we'll hand wave that for now. Then we have order, family, genus, and species. Now, despite the fact that there are uh, sometimes intermediate labels that get inserted somewhere in between these, in fact, sometimes there are chains of intermediate labels. For example, between insects and then arthropods, there are stuff, labels such as, say, hexapods, which are a bit of an issue. But the main labels are these in terms of the taxon that are used, or taxa, because that's a plural. So dichotomous keys. Uh, dichotomy is a matter of split in two. So dichotomous keys is essentially a matter of using classifications that branch into twos. We do point out that you could potentially have bill straight and bill strongly curved as your initial classifications and have them split into elongated and not elongated. But usually we will seek the uh, branching scheme that has the least branches necessary. Why? Because comp more complex branching schemes are usually considered to be less likely. Now, dichotomous keys can also be used to identify objects, such as uh, sorting things that we've probably done way back in, uh, well, before going to grade school. So learning the differences between, say, squares and circles or something like that. So agreeing on criteria for taxa can be a bit of a problem, and so can common names. Now, in summary, classification systems are useful, but they tend to vary quite a bit. For example, the common names for horseshoe crabs probably based on the fact that uh, they have a hard shell, they have legs, many legs, they look like a horseshoe, and they come out of the sea, like crabs do. So, that's, well, I hope we all know that jellyfish are not fish, not, nor are starfish, which should be, really be called sea stars. Now, as we can see, the common name classification schemes can vary greatly in terms of their validity, usually not very much. But of course, sometimes they do work well, such as the species group known as dogs. Classification systems are most useful when they are consistently used by a large number of people over a large area, such as the uh, current official scientific classification system. Now, the science of classifying living things or dead things as in formerly living things, is called taxonomy. A taxon, plural taxa, is essentially a criteria by which things are grouped. Now, all species are given a unique binomial two-word species name. Technically speaking, you can also say that the entire name from domain downward is unique. Why? Because even if they're in the same genus, the last word is different. But the name that is commonly used is the two-word species name, as in genus, species. This can be a little bit hard to suss out for, say, bacteria, which is why we have E. coli, strain, blah, 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 with letters and numbers. 
because different species of E. coli can have more genetic differences between them in terms of percentage than between a human and a platypus, which is a monotreme, the most primitive form of mammal, or at least the pr most primitive form of mammal that remains. So traditional taxonomy groups species together according to their shared characteristics. Now traditional taxonomy focused a great deal on morphology. It also had quite a bit to do with embryology, so embryonic development studies. Now some of these are considered not very valid. Why? Because sometimes it can turn out that two species that look alike morphologically can be genetically quite different, whereas two species that look different morphologically can be genetically quite similar, which of course is then a problem. Now scientists often disagree about the criteria that is used to group species. So should, for example, for our previous example, the elongated bill come first or should a hooked bill come first in terms of yes-no dichotomies? Well, sometimes it happens to be, oh, we have an equal number of dichotomies for both. So the least branching points usually mean the best choices. Which means, what exactly? Well, if we have the equal branching points for both, then let's do some genetic studies instead. Now, genetic studies can just brute force this whole thing from the beginning, but sometimes they can be a little bit expensive. Hence, this is a bit of a problem for at least traditional taxonomy, i.e. before genetics, before uh, high throughput genetics really took off. So traditional taxonomy groups species into a number of major levels or taxa. Namely, Linnaeus had kingdoms, phylums, class, order, family, and genus, and then species, and then subspecies if relevant. For example, E. obsoleta obsoleta for a certain group of snakes which we saw last time or Homo sapiens sapiens. Now, dichotomous keys are often used to help identify species in terms of, let's check these characteristics to see if they're different between these two groups of organisms that we think are two species. Now, it could be that it could be, say, sexual dimorphism. For example, certain birds have really brightly colored males and really dull boring looking females which blend in well. For example, birds of paradise or peacocks. They have very elaborately decorated males. And without actually long-term observations, the explorers who uh, wandered into the jungle would probably not necessarily recognize that they were the same species as the peahens. By the way, peacocks and peahens are in general called peafowl. I realize that most people just call them peacocks anyway because the male is just so much more recognizable and therefore they uh, take on that name. But anyhow, <laughs> there are a few things that science just lets slide and referring to peafowl as peacocks is usually one of them which is nice. Now, what else can dichotomous keys be used for? Well, okay, we talked about this previously. They can be used to build taxonomic trees. Why is it that most taxonomies tend to go that way? It's because that Latin-based languages write from left to right. So progress through time on a timeline is often depicted from, you guessed it, left to right. And these, if the divergence times are known, then often these branches 
will be proportional in length to time since estimated divergence between the two lineages. Usually though, we don't draw them like this. Why? Usually, we make sure that at least the very top, or sometimes the very bottom, is a one single line. This is because we usually have an outlier. Now the outlier can potentially be the basal lineage as depicted here, and this here is called Okay, let's label this. This is usually referred to as the in-group. You may have heard of the term monophyletic or paraphyletic or polyphyletic before. Monophyletic just means that they have one common ancestor and none of the descendant species of that common ancestor are excluded. The others, well, you can talk about it at a later point. Often, though, you will see the outlier get labeled as a separate branch. And usually, unless you're reasonably sure that the morphology of, say, this species here hasn't changed since this point, punctuated equilibrium is a thing, then usually it's going to look like this instead. So as you can see, here, we have our dichotomy be actually uh, not just, oh, one line comes out of another line. It splits into two lines. We are not sure what the ancestor resembled more between this species and this species. So, that's it for this brief introduction to taxonomy, and we'll see each other again then next time.